Hello. Today we're going to talk about getting your assets from this bad boy to this bad boy. We are going to go over these three kinds of exports. Static meshes and their basics. Skeletal meshes or rigs, meaning custom skeletal meshes, as well as how to rig and animate your own character to the Unreal Mannequin skeleton, completely free. And finally, how to export entire scenes and some other tips and tricks along the way. Before we get started, first, as I'm making this video, I'm using Blender 4.4.3, and we'll be exporting to Unreal Engine 4.24, all the way up to the current latest release, 5.5. The reason I will be partially using Unreal Engine 4.24 is because everything will be forward compatible. However, Unreal Engine projects are not backwards compatible. Secondly, this is not a fully fledged tutorial on how to make 3D models or characters. This is simply my personal workflow that you can use for your completed assets. I will provide the resources you can use to learn a bit more in depth on some of these topics. I'm going to go over some very basic things here in an attempt to cover as much as I possibly can. I want to be thorough, so bear with me, as I can bet I have some information even longtime pros aren't aware of. This information may change in future releases. Let's get started with static meshes. We will start with scale. This topic can be rather frustrating to say the least. Unit discrepancies are a thing between Blender and UE, more so for Unreal Engine 4 and less so for Unreal Engine 5. It's especially frustrating for skeletal meshes, which I will talk about in the next section. However, for static meshes, it's not really a thing. For a long time, you've had to change your Blender scene units to 0.01 meters. While it fixes the discrepancies, it can cause issues in other areas specifically for Blender. For static meshes, all you really need to do is model to real world scale, as you should when modeling anything. I recommend measuring often and using references like the UE mannequin, which is roughly 6 feet or 1.82 meters tall. Something you should get used to doing while working in Blender is apply your transforms. The shortcut is Control A, apply all transforms. Edit mode won't affect scale, object mode will. If there are any issues with scale between Blender and UE, this is your first culprit. It can also affect how modifiers work in Blender, so it's really just best practice to apply transforms. Note that applying transforms will make the object's origin return to the world origin, which is our next topic. Before we get to pivot points, we should note that Unreal Engine's forward-facing direction is negative Y in Blender. You should create everything with its front side facing negative Y. The pivot point or object origin in Blender is where your object rotates, moves, and scales from in Blender and Unreal Engine. However, when exporting an object from Blender to UE, Unreal will import Blender's world origin as the object's pivot point or object origin. So you must set where you want your object origin in Blender, then move the object to world origin before export. It can be wherever you want, but modular assets typically have them in the corner or somewhere that allows them to fit together easily. An easy way to achieve this without add-ons is by moving the 3D cursor to where you want the origin in edit mode, set the origin to 3D cursor in object mode, cursor to world origin, selection to cursor. Next is materials and material slots. The materials you have on your object will come over as material slots in Unreal Engine with their naming conventions. They can be added, edited, and removed in Unreal Engine. I typically work with baked textures, which are pretty much plug and play. Procedural textures in Blender won't transfer over, but can be recreated in UE for the most part with their respective nodes. How your object looks in Blender is how it will look in Unreal. We will talk about export settings in just a second, but make sure your object is shaded how you want in Blender. You must triangulate your object in Blender before export. You should do this even before you texture paint. In 3D programs, your objects will always end up triangulated, as that is how GPUs render 3D objects. However, different 3D programs will triangulate in different ways. This is just a fact. We can talk about the long debated quads versus tries when modeling another time. If you don't ensure your object is triangulated and shaded how you want in Blender, the other 3D programs could alter your shading by the way it triangulates your mesh. That can lead to undesired outcomes. To quickly cover UVs, you can create multiple UVs in Blender, which can be good for things like custom light map UVs, but I'm pretty sure light maps are the devil's work, and mostly, I just don't know much about them, so I'm going to move on. If you do create your own light map UV, though, make sure you don't allow Unreal to generate one, as it does it automatically. Each UV is a draw call for your object, which can affect performance. Finally, some last notes, custom collisions, sockets, and LODs. 
all three of these things can be made in Unreal Engine. I'm only going to briefly talk about creating custom collisions. The other two I haven't personally created in Blender as UE has great tools to create these. Custom collisions are the only things that might be easier or necessary to make in Blender. You can make four different types. Boxes, capsules, spheres, and convex objects. These objects will be exported in the same file as your object. They must inherit their respective prefixes to work properly. You can create complex convex objects as one or multiple objects, but I don't really know what's best practice here. But according to UE documentation, there should be a small gap between multiple convex holes for best results. I don't know why, but the documents are vaguely intimidating, so it's probably best to just do what they say. Frankly, I didn't even know you could create sockets in Blender till I looked at UE's documentation. Seems like it's possibly useful for something like modular assets that could be worth looking into for some of you. That's most of the basics, and probably only a recap for most. A lot of that info can be used for skeletal meshes as well. Now let's talk about export settings and methods. There is a send to Unreal add-on created by Epic themselves. However, I don't find it necessary or very helpful as I like a lot of control. It also is no longer being maintained by Epic. It is being maintained by some very awesome people on GitHub. I'll leave the link in the description. I prefer the tried and true simple FBX export. These are my settings. I have selected objects, object types as mesh, and under geometry, smoothing face, and that's pretty much all you need for static meshes. Don't forget that you can save a preset for all your different types of exports. Note, while path mode is copy, I don't import my textures in with FBXs, nor do I let UE create materials for my objects, and I'll explain that at the end of the video. Now quickly before we export, we should talk about naming conventions. Unreal uses prefix sm underscore for their static meshes. In Blender, you can batch rename objects with control F2. If you are exporting a single model, the static mesh will inherit the file name saved to your folder. If you are batch exporting, it will set your file name as a prefix to the object name in your outliner. Getting these right can save you a lot of time in renaming objects. Renaming objects in Unreal is painful and time consuming as there is no native batch renamer. There is, however, a paid plugin. I think its 4.7 star rating is good proof of just how bad it is natively. Now, here are my import settings for Unreal. We want to import normals and tangents, and I choose to not create materials and not import textures. And again, I'll explain that after we get through exporting things from Blender. All right, with all that out of the way, let's talk about skeletal mesh exports. This is where things get weird and borderline psychotic if you don't know the quirks. First, let's talk about how you can rig and animate your own character, the UE4 or UE5 skeleton, completely free. To do this, we need two free add-ons for Blender. Game Rig Tools by CG Dive and UE to Rigify by Epic. UE to Rigify is now maintained by those awesome people on GitHub. I'll leave links to download both as well as tutorials on them in the description. While Game Rig Tools is a free add-on, I of course recommend you donate to them if you can. It is an incredible add-on and they deserve all the support they can get. With this add-on, you can rig any character to the UE4 or 5 skeleton with ease. CG Dive has many great tutorials on rigging. I highly recommend you check them out. Once your character is rigged to the UE skeleton, you can animate it using the UE to Rigify add-on. It's really simple to set up. You just need to adjust the meta rig to your character, and then you're all set to animate. I'll leave links to Epic's official YouTube tutorials on the subject in the description. Now, anybody that has imported the UE skeleton to Blender knows the bone orientations are a mess. For your own sanity, do not try to change this outside of the add-ons I just talked about. The gods will curse you with infinite headaches, and it's just not worth it. Now let's talk about exporting skeletal meshes and animations and the quirks involved in the process. We're going to have to revisit how scale works real quick. Unreal Engine 4, specifically the UE4 mannequin and custom rigs and animations made for UE4, need to be made in a blender with a scene unit scale of 0.01. Or... The rig itself needs to be scaled to 0.01. If not, the skeletons might look fine in UE, but the animations will be all sorts of messed up. However, for UE5, this doesn't really matter. You just need to make sure any shared skeletons don't have any unit discrepancies. If you are using the UE4 mannequin in Unreal Engine 5, though, it still needs that 0.01 scaling. If you choose to work in Blender with a default unit scale of 1, there is a workaround for armatures. You scale your rig by 100, apply the scale, scale your rig by 0.01, and then just leave it at that. The mesh itself can be scaled normally. A couple final notes. It's typically best to make sure your rig is scaled properly before skinning or weight painting, 
and it's pretty much essential that it's done before animating because scaling animations rarely works well. If you are going to use game rig tools in the UE to rigify, you have to use a Blender scene unit scale of 0.01. Game rig tools will give you a rig that is natively scaled to 0.01, which you can use in default Blender, but with the scene unit scale of 0.01, you need to scale it by 100 and apply the scale because UE to rigify requires a rig that has applied scale of 1. UE to rigify doesn't work in Blender with a scene unit scale of 1. All of your animations will come out as Gigantor. This includes UE5 as well. With that confusion out of the way, we will talk about naming conventions and requirements. For custom skeletal meshes, the armature object or rig must be named armature exactly. Otherwise, UE will create a root bone for you named after whatever you named your rig. Alternatively, you can name your rig root and let UE create the root bone for you. Just make sure you don't add a bone named root or it won't import. With those headaches out of the way, we can talk about exporting animations. First of all, for animation setup, you gotta set your frame rate to 30 FPS and set frame start to zero. Why? Well, 30 FPS is just kind of the standard for game animation and it easily scales an engine. Why start at zero though? Well, Blender and albeit other DCCs, standard is to start animation on frame one. Unreal starts animations on frame zero. So if you make your 30 frame animation from one to 30, you will only export 29 frames in Unreal Engine. Changing your frame start and keys to zero makes sure you get all the frames that you want. Alternatively, you can make sure the animation stops with an extra frame, but that feels disorganized and I have OCD. Now on to export settings and methods for exporting animations. For my skeletal mesh export settings, I have two presets, one with animations and one without. This is pretty similar to the static mesh exports, except in object types, we have armature selected as well. We are going to uncheck only deform bones and add leaf bones. And then for animations, we're going to key all bones, check all actions, and then check for start and end. Typically, I export all actions. However, you also have the option of using NLA strips. For NLA strips, only the tracks that are checked will be exported, which can be useful if you only need to alter one animation. You can push all actions down into their own tracks and check and uncheck which you would want, or you can put all actions into one track and export that. They will be imported as separate animations regardless. Use the all actions export or the NLA strips. Using both will result in duplicates. Some final notes for skeletal meshes. For the most part, the import settings in Unreal are similar to the static meshes. Just make sure if you're importing the UE skeleton to choose the existing skeleton in your project. And when working with UE to rigify and sometimes your own skeletons, imported animations can be messed up. In this case, we need to click Preserve Local Transforms. Coincidentally, UE 5.5 has just changed their importer and exporter to what they call Interchange. The Preserve Local Transforms button has disappeared for some reason. In order to get the old import dialog back, you need to enter this console command. I'm sure they will bring that button back as it is pretty important. I've found that sometimes UE will have trouble importing the animations. In that case, I export the mesh and rig alone then I export the rig and animations only into another file for import. Don't know why that happens, but it's an easy workaround. Lastly, if you have a mesh with shape keys, otherwise known as morph targets in UE, Blender won't export with applied modifiers because natively you cannot apply a modifier to an object with shape keys. For this, you have a couple options, like apply modifiers before creating shape keys, or use a free add-on called SK Keeper to apply modifiers after you've already made your shape keys. To make sure your triangulation modifier transfers to UE properly, you will need to apply it to the mesh before exporting it if it has shape keys. For the most part, that's it for skeletal meshes. Now we can talk about scene exports before we wrap up with some workflow tips. Now, I don't have a lot of experience with this, but it is something I've looked into. And to be honest, if you look it up, it isn't really something people do. People usually create assets in Blender and then block out and assemble in Unreal. I, on the other hand, have a lot more experience building things in Blender. According to Unreal documentation, FBX Scene Import supports these following assets. Static meshes, skeletal meshes, animations, materials, textures, rigid mesh, morph targets, cameras, and lights. There are two ways you can do this. File, import into level, or content browser, import, choose file type, FBX Scene. Both methods pop up the same window. There are a couple ways you can use this. Create level actors and create blueprint asset. I think those are pretty self-explanatory, but here are some notes. Create Level Actors adds the meshes directly into the level and world outline with their origins intact. Create Blueprint Asset creates a reusable blueprint and an empty for the world origin. 
that you can use to scale and rotate all the actors together while still being able to affect each object separately as well. With the Blueprint Actor, you can't see all the actors in the World Outliner, but you can see them in the Details tab of the Blueprint. I think the Blueprint Asset will have some good uses, but if you want to use the Create Level Actors and control them together like the Blueprint Asset, you can export your scene parented to an empty in Blender to get the same effect. For now, this is the method I'll be trying. However, there is an honorable mention for USD Import Plugin. It says it's still in beta, but I don't know anything about it, and it seems pretty versatile. Rally B 3 d has a really great video on it, and I'll leave it in the description. Note that I could only get this to work in UE5. That's quite literally everything I know about exporting from Blender to Unreal, but we aren't quite done yet, right? Why don't I import materials and textures with the FPXs? Honestly, I would say this is more of a personal workflow preference and purely for organization and ease. Materials and textures take a considerable amount of effort to set up properly in Unreal. First off, required textures for PBR rendering can take some setting up. You need to make sure your textures are the right color space, sRGB or not. My occlusion roughness metallic maps always import as RGB when they are not. You need to make sure your normal map is DirectX or OpenGL and flip the green channel if needed. You need to set up the proper texture group for optimization. And if your textures look uggo, you need to mess with the compression settings. For materials, it's best practice to use a master material and material instances. If I import an FBX with textures and materials, it will create more materials than I need because I will likely only use one master material and the rest as material instances. It's more time consuming to fix all the problems of the import than it is to just set it up manually with more control. Some bonus tips and other things to look into. Exporting GLTF from Blender to Unreal seems to set up some of the materials, but it still requires some TLC. If you really want to do that, check it out. You can also export cloth sims and other simulations as Olympic exports. I don't know anything about it, but it's worth looking into. My last tip is that reuse where you can. I have an Unreal Engine 4.24 project set up named Utilities, where I create master materials and other reusables that I can migrate to current projects so I don't have to recreate everything all the time. You can do the same with Blender asset libraries. Set them up once and reap the benefits. And that's pretty much it. That's all I got for you right now. If I missed anything important, or if you know more or have tips of your own, please leave them in the comments. Of course, I may end up remaking this video if things change or my workflow improves. If you found this video helpful, please leave a like and subscribe. I hope to share a lot of things I've learned from this great community in the future. Thanks for watching.